Hello there, my YouTube channels. Lord Bobbity Fortescue here. Today, you'll find me playing Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters, a 1989 coin op developed by Atari Games. Here, one is tasked with saving a research scientist, Dr. Sarah Bellum, from an invading army, the Reptilons who want to enslave the human race via the means of a robot army. Oh, the bounders! In each level, the player must free the human slaves, flip the power switch, and use the escalator to advance to the next area. Playing this game reminds me of a similar predicament of my old chum, Bunty Norris. It all started one fine spring evening in the village hall. It has long been a tradition for Fort School Village Hall to be the venue for fortnightly lectures every other Thursday. Topics vary enormously. By far the most popular speaker is our old sports and science master, Malty Milburn. The past year had seen Malty give a series of talks, which he had entitled Wonders of the Universe. They were Creative Beekeeping, the internal combustion engine, and off-grid fishing, and, on this particular occasion, advanced topiary. In truth, the subject matter matters little, as it is Malty's magnetic personality and meandering anecdotes which really enrapture his audience. Instead of being a member of the audience this time, I had been asked to assist. As I arrived and negotiated my way around the various artificial hedges scattered about the stage, one of them spoke to me. Hello, Bobbity! I see Mr. Milburn has drafted you in too! I looked down to see Bunty, securing a hedge to the stage with some sticky tape. Yes, Bunty, I'm on hedge-holding duty. What's your role? Ah, well, Bobbity, said Bunty, I'm in charge of the PowerPoint. Oh, all off-stage stuff. And I'm in charge of the lighting switch, came a voice from the wings. I looked across to see it was our old chum and local newspaper editor, Tizer Tompkins. Right, lads, said Malty, balancing his chainsaw precariously against a flimsily secured hedge. It looks like we're almost ready, and the doors are open. And so the audience began to flow in. Right, Tizer, time to build atmosphere. Atmosphere you shall have, announced Tizer, as he dimmed the house lights. Oh, that's how I like an audience, lads, in the dark. And the possibility of mistakes keeps them on their toes. <laughs> Mind your fingers, said Malty, revving and wielding his chainsaw. Now, Bobbity, let's get behind the curtain so we can make a proper entrance. It wasn't long, for our ears were filled with the unmistakable sound of an audience buzzing with excitement, and Malty signalled for the two of us to make our entrance, which was met with a fanfare of applause. Indeed, topiary was tonight's topic by popular demand, for the villagers had witnessed the wonder of Malty's own hedge at Bramble Cottage. It was a depiction of Malty's cat, Bumble, jumping at a giant bee, Malty himself had waxed lyrical about it. My finest work yet, Bumble and the Bee, a masterpiece in Hedge. Malty's presentation was a winning combination of theory and practice. He dazzled the crowd with his unique brand of pseudoscience and cutting hedge technology. Optimal hedginess for chopping the correct calibre of chainsaw for the perfect level of heft. Malty had created a powerpoint showing a melange of his artistic masterpieces. For example, his hedge expressionist Pythagoras in Privet. And Malty's artistry went beyond hedge. Post-modernist kings and queens in Conifer and Spider-Man in Spruce in cubist form. Then, Malty's practical demonstration further wowed the crowd, 
as with the dexterity of an elf. He hewed, sliced, and carved at the hedge, which I held in my trembling arms. The plastic leaves and trimmings cascaded onto the audience, falling and sparkling like shooting stars on beaming, upturned faces. Eventually, it was time for the big finish, before an interval of tea and coffee, followed by a question and answer session, and the monthly Tombola prize draw. Malty's words, And that, my friends, is how you turn your privet hedge into your cat, or, as I like to call it, hedging your pets, <laughs> signalled the switching on of the house lights. Then, as Bunty walked onto the stage to remove the hedges, there were oohs and ahs and gasps and calls of It's Bunty! There he is! from the back of the hall. And there, at the back of the hall, was a phalanx of females, the ladies of the village, dressed up in all their finery. Their laser eyes locked on their target as it moved across the stage. As mentioned in a previous story, Bunty, blissfully unaware of his devilish good looks and disarming charm, is Fortescue Village's most eligible bachelor. But uh, there had been no mention of Bounty in the forthcoming events section of last week's Fortescue Scoop, just the usual notice of Malty's lecture. Somehow, word had leaked out, and this was the result. I lucked at Malty. Malty lucked at me. We both lucked at Bunty. Who was oblivious to the danger he was in and the kerfuffle that was about to ensue. What a great reception, Mr. Milburn, sir! Your talk has gone down a treat! At this point, Malty took charge and swung into action. Tizer, get out here! Right, forget the interval. Waffle on a bit. Then start the prize draw. Use all your skills of misdirection. We need to get Bunty to safety. Then get across to the puzzled peacock and line them up. We'll execute an exfiltration through the rear exit and meet you in 15 minutes. Men's bar. Don't worry, Malty. You can rely on me. Tizer stepped to the front of the stage and, playing for time, began. The tombola will be drawn in just a few minutes. But first, never before in the long history of Fort School Scoop has a story like this one come along. Thus far, it has been classified at the highest level. But I can now reveal that last summer, a UFO was sighted in the skies above the village. As the ladies of the village were sufficiently distracted, Malty and I got a firm grip of Bunty and ushered him backstage. What about our cups of tea? questioned Bunty. Didn't you see the audience? I asked. Of course, Bobberty. I saw all the usual crowd. The vicar, Eugene and... A frown appeared on Bunty's forehead. Several ladies of the village. Actually, more than several now I stop to think of it. Yes, Bunty. And all of them after you. Let's get to the back door. And so we headed to the village hall's rear exit. I opened the door before hastily closing it again. They're there, I said. Who's there, Bobberty? The ladies. Some of them, at least. They're lying in wait. We're too late. There's going to be an attempt at a breach. This calls for drastic countermeasures. Follow me. We're going dark. Dark, Mr. Milburn, sir? Yes, Bunty, dark. On two levels. Level one, the metaphorical. We're not letting our actions be known. And level two, the practical. We're going subterranean. This way. Malty manoeuvred a cabinet to one side, revealing a hatch in the floor, through which we went and down some stone steps. We had entered what seemed to be a very dark underground tunnel. How Malty had knowledge of such things was a perpetual puzzlement. Amongst the bric-a-brac on the floor of the tunnel was a box of candles. Here, take these, 
said Malty, whose illuminated face now appeared to be floating in front of us. As my eyes adjusted, I could see that Malty was holding a candle in front of his chest. He passed one to Bunty and me, and lit them from the wick of his own. Never let yourself get boxed in, lads, said Malty. Always have an exit strategy. Even from the village hall, Mr. Milburn, sir? Even from everywhere, Bunty. Especially the village hall, replied Malty, somewhat cryptically, tapping his nose. We were soon to discover that we were in a maze of tunnels. These tunnels have been here for years, and have been used for all kinds of shenanigans. And by all kinds of ne'er-do-wells, Mr. Milburn, sir. That's right, Bunty. Now, we're going under the road and the village green, and then on to the puzzled peacock. We'll pop up in the beer garden and have ourselves a nice cold beer. Let's go. Along we went with our flickering candles. We traversed several chambers, in which were scattered half-hidden objects, buried in shadows or covered with cobwebs. At one junction can be heard the gurgling of an underground river. At another, what sounded like a horde of rats, chattering and rattering. We had to get from A to B, but it was becoming clear that getting there would be via X, Y, and Z. Suddenly, Malty halted us. Uh, Do you smell that, lads? We stopped and sniffed. There was certainly a stench of some sort in that dead, dank air. Uh, Could it be an underground volcano, Mr. Milburn, sir? I've always suspected that Fortescue Village was seismically special, and that's the telltale smell of sulphur, unless I'm very much mistaken. (laughs) You you are, Bunty. That's not sulphur. It's sewerage. We're in the bowels of the sewers, so to speak. (laughs) Chuckled Morty. About (laughs) turn. We retraced our steps, and then, at Morty's bidding, tucked the next left. This led us up a gradient and brought us to a large wooden door. Right, lads, let's have a gander, said Morty, moving his candle closer. Yes, this looks promising. If you all give it a big push in three, two... On one, the door swung open in a cloud of dust, and the light from our candles danced across what looked to be an old storeroom. Empty pallets were piled against the walls, and barrels were strewn haphazardly across the floor. We stepped in cautiously. The door swung back with a loud thud and locked into place again. I turned back, and to my dismay, saw that the door had no handle on our side. If there was no other exit, then we were trapped. I was distracted from this disquieting train of thought by the observations of Bunty. Ah, this must be the puzzle Peacock's old cellar, when it was an old coaching house. I agreed that Bunty's conclusions seemed quite feasible. I lucked to Malty for his response, but he was not listening. In fact, Malty wasn't paying attention to us or our locked room dilemma at all. His candlelight was glinting off something on the floor, and he was crouching down, scrutinising it intently. A shiver rattled through me. Had Malty seen an omen? A skeleton? A broken key? A curse on a scroll? Uh, Something to confirm the fear that I was now allowing to take hold of me. That we were trapped, locked in this dismal dungeon forever. Uh, I could see the headline of Fortescue Scoop now composed by a tier four Tizer Tompkins. Fears grow for the Fortescue Three. And then, whatever happened to the Fortescue Three? The 50-year anniversary commemorative souvenir collector's edition pull-out supplement in Fortescue Scoop's Sunday edition, Fortescue News. I pictured a vigil in the coming days. Arabella holding a candle for me outside the village hall. Melissa holding a candle for Malty and all the rest of the ladies of the village holding candles for Bunty. I was taken out of my morbid musings by movement from Malty. He turned round slowly and looked at us. In one hand he held his candle, and in the other... Otter's crotch! Uh, Sorry, Mr. Milburn, sir. Oh, 
It's a bottle of Otter's Crotch, the beer of the connoisseur. First brewed in 1911 and banned in 1987, after all of that daft health and safety nonsense was invented. 12% proof and reputed to enhance IQ. Malty shook the bottle and grinned again. Oh, oh, it's even got bits in. <laughs> I never thought I'd see another bottle in my lifetime. Uh, can't you've just got the recipe yourself, Mr. Milburn, sir? No, Bunty. The recipe was also outlawed. All copies burnt, shredded, or buried in secret locations. A familiar glint appeared in Malty's eye. Oh, so we were told. <laughs> Malty picked up a cobweb-covered pamphlet entitled Otter's Crotch Brewing Instructions. It must have been saved from the purge, sir! exclaimed Bunty. It was salvaged for future generations, for a time when the age of madness had passed, and England would once more be free to brew beer that was detrimental to one's health. Just at that moment, there was a creaking sound, and an oblong of light appeared from above. We blinked upwards. A head appeared. I say, what are you lot doing down there? I've had the beers in for ages. I've ended up drinking them all, <laughs> slurred a somewhat sozzled Tizer. I thought you must have got lost or something. We were lost, Tizer, but now we're found, pronounced Malty triumphantly. Uh, fantastic. Anyway, I get another round in. What do you all want? A pint for me, please, Tizer. And the same for me. Uh, what about you, Malty? We turned to luck at Malty who was grinning broadly. Me? <laughs> I'll have a bottle of Otter's Crotch! Good job! Now get to the next factory and rescue our people! If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like me, tell your chums. Until next time, this is Lord Bobberty Fortescue saying, Toodle Pipsy and down the hatch, my YouTube chums!